Your reward is air conditioning. <laughs> That's the teaching, well, you can vote on that, but the air conditioning is here. Amen? All right. If you got your Bible with you, turn to the little letter of, we call him Philemon. Philemon. Um, it's uh, right after Titus and one of Paul's last letters. It's a very personal one. As we're going to see, some people, uh, commentators and so on, question whether it actually should be in the canon of Scripture because it seems so personal. Um, do we have a right to read somebody's personal mail? You know, does it have an application to us? But for the end of the first century, it was pretty much agreed on that this belonged in God's Word. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 16, but we'll be just, I, I just encourage you to leave the book open because we'll be looking at other verses too. But uh, the text is coming from verse 10 uh, through 16. Philemon, verse 10 through 16. I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to you unprofitable, but now profitable to you and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, when I would have retained him with me, that in your stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without your mind would I do not even one thing, that your benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that you should receive him forever. Now, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You can become who you are. It's our, our Bible study tonight. Before we get into this, I have to confess. They say confession is good for the soul. How many remember Sunday morning, I, I said there's an acronym I read in a book recently, uh, E-G-O, ego, easing God out. And I said, you know, that's just the, that, that's just the Greek word for I, you know, ego, right? And I, and I said, I'm looking at my notes, you know, E-G-O, ego, you know, epsilon, gamma. And I said, omicron, you know, which it's not, it's omega. So the pastor made a mistake. I'm looking at my notes, E-G-O. So I see the O and I say omicron, but it's it's not. It's omega. So I'm just confessing. Forgive me. Will you do that? Yeah, don't mix your notes with your brain, you know, uh, especially when it's a, dealing with another language. But anyway, I got that out of the way. But I did want you to think that I just picked up the Greek New Testament yesterday and I still don't know uh, the, the, the alphabet. Oh, that was awful. I got home and I got that cold chill. I thought, did I really say Omicron? Oh, me, you know. And there was an EGO. Whoops. So what I want to do tonight is split this up a little bit, kind of in two. And I want to concentrate with you first on love in action, which I think we're all really in need of. Love being walked out, lived out from one believer to another. And then kind of what he says about this household servant, this slave, if you will. And I want you to think of this with me, not just as an historical account of a friend of Paul and a um, household servant of this guy Philemon, but but I want you to kind of look at it with me also prophetically. I think you'll see the symbol is there. The illustration is there of you and me and every lost person that has come to God. And you have there, which we'll see tonight, you have the picture of what God intended. And then you see the person going wrong, taking the wrong road and then being reclaimed. And isn't that true of all of us? So he's a really beautiful illustration. I hope it reminds you of your past life, your present life, and then we're going to close with how can we see more of what was damaged showing through now? How can we see more of God's original plan for us rather than the wreck we made or other people made or the devil made or usually a combination? Are you all tracking with me? So first of all, look at this concept of the Christian love in action. We could, we could actually call this from Pavlos, you know, with love, because this is really a very personal letter from Paul to Philemon. And as I mentioned, some even question, should it really be in the New Testament canon? Um, is this a word, is this a letter 
like the other letters in, in the New Testament, for the body of Christ? Or is it really just something personal? Um, but look at verses 1 and 2. That's why I asked you to keep your, your uh, Bible open, not just to verse 10, but we're going to look at the whole thing. Let's look at this. If you look at verses 1 and 2, you see a different story. First of all, Paul calls himself a, pres a prisoner of whom? Isn't that neat? He doesn't say prisoner of Nero, you know, which was literally the case. Um, I've said this you know, a couple million times, but like Paul, I think you and I probably need x-ray glasses almost all the time so we can see beyond the scene, you know? See the S-C-E-N-E -E -E behind the S-W-E-N. Paul looked right past Nero, and he basically said, God is sovereign in my life. Nero wouldn't have any control over me at all unless it was given to, me, to him from upstairs. So I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord's prisoner, not his. And then he calls um, his friend, To Agapito, the beloved one, and his wife, Aphia, he says, T Agapiti, which is the beloved one, female. And will you notice, you get the real picture here now, a third party, Arhipos, he calls a fellow soldier, and then the punchline. And the church, the one in your house. So how many see right from the beginning, it's not only a personal letter. It's, it's information for the whole church. Yeah, he's writing to his friend, but also his friend's wife, also a member of that church who was a minister in his own right, and then the church, period. You may remember, as I've said, um, a lot of New Testament churches were just that. They were house churches, house fellowships. And uh, I remember when the so-called Jesus movement started in the 1960s and went into the 70s, so many people got saved during that move of God, and out of that movement came so many Christian leaders. A lot of things happened in house meetings, house churches. And uh, maybe because of the intimacy, I don't know, uh, but in any case, there were so many meetings. That's how I began my ministry, teaching in those house meetings, 30, 40 people or whatever you could get in a kitchen, living room, you know, spill over. You'd have worship. You would have ministry, the gifts of the Spirit. You would have um, a time of uh, ministry one-on-one. -on -one. And then usually the Lord's Supper followed by what they used to call in the New Testament days the agape, the, the love feast. I mean, it was literally like being in New Testament Christianity. It was really nice, and there were so many of them. And that's what this is. Now, why would or why could Paul address this man and address this church so personally, so intimately? Why did he feel comfortable doing that? Love. He had a heart full of love for this guy, for his wife, for our hippos, for everybody in that church. He knew these people. And basically... He had a loving relationship with uh, Philemon in, in particular because he was an apostle talking to a pastor. And I can testify to you that this works both ways. When I um, was doing uh, full-time ministry overseas, it I was kind of fulfilling an apostolic call to Australia. I, I had a handful of meetings when we first got there. And the idea was, you know, we were... Uh, evangelizing for a particular full gospel denomination there, the largest one in that country. Uh, but it still was kind of up to the local pastors to open their hearts to the visiting preacher, you know, who wants the yank this week, you know. And we just had a hope that God would open the doors. And I preached in a beautiful little town called Bundaberg. And uh, the pastor there was just a lovely guy. He used to go to India once a year. He preached to about 50,000 people. Had a real heart for India. And I told him I thought God was going to send me there someday, which he did, but not physically. But my books and my courses are there. Here I am, Lord, send them, you know. That happens when you get old. But uh, he made some phone calls. And he said, hey, you know what, to these pastor friends, and some of them had large churches. Hey, you know, I had Brother Joe here, and, and this happened, that happened, and so many people got the baptism, and so many people were healed, and deaf ears, and this and that. And we wound up, Barb remembers, we wound up with a year, almost a year and a half, more than a year and a half of meetings. Almost boom, just like that. Because he had this relationship with me and I with him, even though we didn't know each other. Separated by 10,000 miles, you know. I don't know whether he had the accent or I did, but he still got along. And uh, this is the same kind of thing. He opened all these doors. So the same thing with Paul as an apostle to this pastor 
And also, he was a spiritual father. Look at verse 19 sometime. Same letter. Look at verse 19. And Paul basically says, you owe me yourself, Sefton. You owe me yourself, meaning I brought you to Christ. When? Well, we don't know. Could be when Paul was in, was in Ephesus, when he was in Asia Minor. Could have been that's when this fellow heard Paul and received the Lord. But in any case, he had brought this uh, man to saving faith. And I want to mention something since it's so uh, beautifully phrased here. It's almost like a, one of these little diamonds in the dust. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily see it till you stop and have a look-see. It's amazing what God can put in 25 verses, isn't it? The, you know, I don't know what kind of Bible you have. In, this, in my Bible, this whole letter is one half a page. Right above it is the end of Titus, you know. Crazy, but a lot of stuff. Um, the... the um, as we're going to see, he goes on now to get to the point. And you, you almost wonder if he read How to Win Friends and Influence People. I'm kidding. But he's, you know, he's, not, uh, he's not stupid, this guy, Paul. He knows you have to have tact to make contact, right? And so he, he you know, love to you, love to your wife, love to the staff, love to the church, you know, and, and uh, just kind of reminding him, you know, uh, don't forget, you know, we, we go back, we have a history, and then he makes the request, you know? And here it is, I am beseeching you. Everybody say beseeching. Boy, you hear this word a lot. You go to Greece today, I mean, in modern Greek, they, parakalo, parakalo. You call somebody, they pick up the phone, parakalo. You know, that's their version of hello, actually. Uh, but that's, it, it means, it's, it's a form of the word we get our, our word for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I'm beseeching you concerning my child. Isn't that beautiful? Onesimus, whom I begot in my bonds. Think about that. How about this guy with an apostolic ministry, not just to the Jewish nation, but to the world, to the Gentiles, and here he is in prison. Can you imagine what he must have felt like? Just like a racehorse, you know, that, <laughs> that cannot get through to run. He must have thought, I mean, I don't know, but I wonder if he kind of thought, what, what good am I doing here, locked away? Nobody's seeing me, no crowds, you know, I'm not casting devils out, I'm not this. And... But while he was in prison, he wrote a couple of letters that we're still kind of enjoying, aren't we? But um, yeah, yeah, think about it. Can you imagine if you had the royalties on his writings? How many Bibles are in print? Wow, you know, man, I like to get that royalty check once a month. But this is fascinating. Because even while he's in prison, he was busy doing one-on-one -on -one ministry. And you've probably heard me mention that. There are a lot of ways to get people into the kingdom. One-on-many, -on -many, where you use the net. You know, this is the evangelist or even Bible teacher or pastor, hopefully. Um, or you can use the hook, one-on-one. -on -one. Most lay folks, you know, will do that, and that's great. Our whole first course kind of mentions that. Each one win one. You finish this course and get your hairy eyeball on somebody that you'd like to bring into the kingdom. Do all you can to get them into the kingdom. Once they are, disciple them and tell them to do the same thing. And everybody win at least one new person every year and disciple them to win one new person. And I've mentioned if we all did that, if the church, the body of Christ did that, the whole world would be saved in less than a week. Because I think there are about a billion people that confess Jesus. And how many people are living on planet Earth? Eight billion or getting there? That multiplication, that, that, that's, you know, that we could save the world in no time. I'm just throwing that out there to kind of stimulate the gray matter. When I first got a hold of that concept, it was like I sat there stunned. I read it in a little book by Charles Allen called, um, oh, what's the name of that book? He's a Methodist preacher. It was a real famous book, but I, I don't recall the name now. But anyway, he mentioned that just in passing. What if everybody that knows Christ won one person to the Lord? and told them to do it, and we all kept doing that. Back when he wrote it, he said in 30-some years, the whole world would be saved, you know. So here's Paul, not one on many, not using the net, but using the hook. And even in prison, he gets this guy saved. And this is very important. Again, like I say, if we just read quickly and read over it, you miss some of these things. But there's so much doctrine, so much teaching that so many people need and don't have. Amen? I begot... If I say begot. So Paul brought Onesimus to saving faith. 
And the way he writes this, it happened not gradually, but at a point in time. Again, he said, I begot him. I brought him to birth. Uh, if you've had uh, children, <laughs> you women that have had children, I'm sure you remember. I know my wife does. There is a process to it, right? About nine months. But there comes a point when the baby is born. And depending on the woman and depending on the circumstances and depending on whether they elected to have meds or not, they are really looking for the birth when it comes time because it's really painful from what I hear. You know, when I hear what some women have gone through, pass, hard pass, don't want to go there. But it happens when? In a moment. Why is that important? Have you ever heard somebody say, am I a Christian? Oh, yeah, I've, I, I, of course I'm a Christian. I come from a Christian home. I grew up in the church. Have you ever heard that? I have. Am I Christian? Absolutely. And I could say the same thing. Oh, yeah, I was baptized when I was a little bald-headed baby, and then I went to church every time I, I was supposed to, took the sacraments regularly, prayed, had prayers answered, went on a retreat, this, that, and the other, I had Christian school, and I was lost. I had all that, and I was lost. At the age of 18, if somebody asked me, if you're going to die today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? I'd said, no. How sad. Why? Because there has to be a birth. When you, and, when you and I share the gospel, we need to remember this. There's got to be a point in time. And you might want to use that illustration because I think it's in the Bible. Sure, there are some steps leading up to a person making that commitment, but there has to come the birth. And how many of you know people that have gone a certain length and then bailed? Yeah, may attend church for a while, may read the books you lend them, uh, may even uh, watch some of the TV preachers or listen to the radio preachers that you recommend, and it looks like, oh, wow, here it comes, here it comes, and then, hey, what happened to Sister Hoopnittle? We don't see her in service anymore. They just didn't follow through. They didn't, uh, they didn't close it, right? So this is very interesting. And can I mention something else that, again, we could skim over in, unless we're going to spend some time. This happens to be my job, so you, you can hitchhike on what I found. But I find this very, very important. How many of you know a lot of people are trusting water baptism for salvation? I'm not being unkind. I'm just simply saying this is what they're taught, that they receive new life through water baptism. Lots of denominations, even Protestant denominations, uh, believe this, that eternal life is received through the water of water baptism. How in God's green earth could Paul have immersed anyone while he's in chains in a jail cell? He literally could not have done. And you know from reading what he says in 1 Corinthians, he, he, he puts preaching the gospel over apart from baptizing. God didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, as though they are not the same thing, right? But I'm just throwing that in free of charge. This is another example. When he says, I begot him while I was in bonds, how in the world is he going to baptize anybody in water? Water had nothing to do with it, but he gave him the word of faith, and he came to new life. Isn't that beautiful? So there's a lot of truth here, as I said. So let's move now from this love in action um, to this beautiful, I think, encouragement. You and I can become who we are. This has to do now with a name, and I'm asking us to think about not only Onesimus, but ourselves, because he's not just a figure in history. I think he, his life, his name, um, everything about him is also, I believe, kind of prophetically illust uh, illustrative of you and me and any human person that hears the gospel. Names are important, and, and Paul spends a little time with this guy's name, has kind of some fun with it. How many of you know that there are some fringe groups in the body of Christ that make a great deal about the name of God? And you can go on YouTube sometime, and they're, they're, they, they, it's almost, again, I'm not being... I don't mean to be unkind, but it's almost comical. This guy will tell you how Jesus' name is pronounced or how God's name is pronounced, and they can't really agree, you know, and how should we address Jesus? What's his real name? I've, I've actually seen and read, you know, you have no business praying, calling him Jesus, or, you know, uh, because you should be calling him such and such, right? And what, what, what do we do? 
we don't have to call him anything, really, because he knows what we need before we ask. You know, if we're like the psalmist, before I utter a word, you know it all together. You understand my thought afar of off, right? If you use his Aramaic name, I just found some people today that seem like they're in agreement. It's, uh, what did I tell you it was, Solomon? I forgot already. Ish, isho, Isho, yeah. Arabic, Isa. Isho, Aramaic. Hebrew, Yeshua, right? Greek, Isus. So what do we call him? Depends what language you speak, yes? Now, my personally, I would go by what he called himself if you want to really be a nitpicker. In John 17, he said, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. He seemed to like his Greek name, whatever. Just throw that in for you at charge. But, I mean, some people ride this thing like a hobby horse. Well, this guy's name, Onesimus, translates to profitable. And I like that. This is where I want you to think of yourself. Think of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It means profitable or useful. And I believe, just like Adam and Eve, God, when he places the human spirit in the womb of the mother, in the act of, of procreation, has a plan, purpose, and provision for every human being, right? As some people call it an assignment. Uh, whatever word you want to use, uh, we're, we're not just you know, put here by accident. I understand the two views of this, uh, but I, I personally believe that Yahweh personally uh, puts the, places the spirit of the person in the womb. And uh, there's, it's, there's a reason for it. There's no accidents, right? And so you could say that God's original plan for this fellow was for him to be profitable to the kingdom of God and to planet earth, for him to be useful in the body of Christ. You can say the same thing about yourself. I don't think it's an accident that's what this guy's name was and that he had a, a relationship with Philemon and then by application by Paul, with Paul. Um, I mentioned uh, once or twice, uh, speaking of names, that um, I found out, well, my first name is Hebrew in background, of course. Yosef means uh, Yahweh shall add. But interestingly enough, my last name is Eastern European in background and the word Kostel, I think it's in the Czech tongue. I'm not Czechoslovakian, but it's kind of all the same. Uh, it, Costel is church. Isn't that funny? And a Costel Nick, if you can Google it, uh, a Costel Nick can be, it would be a churchman, and it can be, it can be anything from like a, the one that cleans the church. It can include a person that prepares the, the communion elements. It can, it can mean a, an assistant priest, a priest, um, any kind of a servant, anybody that looks after the church. So you put my name together, he shall add churchman. And I had, I had finished my first semester in graduate school, and I was home uh, for, on a break, and Barbara and I went to a church in Bellevue, su suburb of where we live, Pittsburgh, and um, Sister Fennel was the lady preacher in this little full gospel church, and uh, I would preach for her when, whenever I was home. She was so nice, and she let me get started because she knew I didn't know beans from apple butter, but I was learning. And one meeting, after one meeting I had with her, she called me out, and she began to uh, pray for me and began to prophesy with, over me and Barb. And, and uh, she said, Brother, she said, I don't know how to say this, but this is like 1975. I see you teaching ministers how to be ministers. I said, What? She said, I don't know how else to say it, but I, I see you teaching ministers how to be ministers. And I thought, I don't know how to be a minister yet. I'm just learning. I'd only been saved about three years, spirit filled one year at that point. And guess what? Within six years, I had taught my first ministry class as a young guy, 20s. And I taught that. I taught a second one. And when I came back from the mission field, I, I got involved teaching an extension class of a seminary in Florida. Did that for 15 years. And then we have in 19... Uh, 85, wrote the first course, and then the others followed, and we've had our own school for over how many years? It's kind of weird, isn't it? But it was in a name. Names can be important, right? Remember when Jesus changed Peter's name? You're no longer Simon, but you're Kephas, you know? And I throw something in for your charge, kind of annoys me. Do you mind? I like to vent. No, I just kind of, some of our Messianic brethren, bless their hearts, they actually change the name in the New Testament. Instead of Peter, they will have Kippah, which is Hebrew for rock. 
But Jesus didn't call him that, did he? He called him Kephas. That's Aramaic. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't, I'm uncomfortable with that kind of thing when you change the text. Jesus wasn't speaking Hebrew to Peter. He was speaking Aramaic, and he called him Kephas. Interestingly enough, this is a freebie. You mind? This is all free. Uh, I just find these things interesting. If you search the scripture after Jesus said that, John's Gospel, chapter 1, and then John says, Kephas means stone, Jesus never calls him that. Read the Gospels. He never calls him by that Aramaic name. He uses the Greek version, Petros, twice. But most of the time he calls him what? Simon. He calls him his Hebrew name, or as I mentioned, scholars aren't really sure. It, that's actually a Greek name also. So it could even be native Greek. Uh, if it's the Greek word for Simon, it would mean pug-faced or flat-faced. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be Hebrew. We don't really know, and I didn't know that. I'm, I'm still learning. How about you guys? Yeah. I, I hope we never stop learning, amen? Uh, but there's a, lot, there's a lot here. So anyway, this guy's name, as I said, translates to profitable or useful. And Paul says, the one, and you have to kind of in, in, insert the words who, who was it's in, implied, the one who was once useless to you. Now, what Paul does here is he does a wordplay that you don't see in the English translation. And it's not a big deal, but I think it's kind of cute. So, onishimos means profitable or, or useful. But Paul says, unlike his name, since he's not only a householder servant for you, but a crook, and he took off with his pants full of money, he says, to you he has become unprofitable. And he uses the word ariston. So alpha, if you put that in front of a word, negates the word. You know, like we have atheists, right? Alpha, a, theos, no God, right? So this is alpha and, and a word um, raome, which means useful, profitable, um, basically what onisimos means, okay? So Paul uses a little play on words, and he says he's not living up to his name. Boy, you can hear a pin drop. Is that you? Is that me? How many are living up to their name? Nobody has, really. God created us in his image after his likeness. And what did we do? Isaiah kind of sums it up, chapter 53. Each one has turned to his own way. He had a plan, and we're forward. We have a better idea. Same thing with this guy. He had a different idea for his life. He wanted to be a thief. So Paul says he's become... Ariston, right? Use, um, useless, unprofitable. And you see this, of course, in the scripture too, the prodigal son. I'm sure his dad didn't plan for him to be so greedy that he would come to his old man someday and say, hey, dad, you know, I've read the will. I got a nice slice coming, but you know what? I really don't want to wait till you kick off. How about giving it to me now? Wouldn't that give his dad a warm feeling? Oh, my son really loves me, you know? Hey, Dad, you look at being pretty good, Nick. You know, you might not die for another 20 years, but give it to me now. I don't think, his, I don't think that excited his father to hear that. Do you? You know, if I mean, Solomon, God forbid, said something like that. Hey, Dad, you know, I, I just found out you're worth more dead than alive. You know, well, I, you know, been to the crew tower lately. Let's go up. You know, you know that would not excite me. I wouldn't feel, uh, I wouldn't feel, feel, feel about that. But he's not that kind of son. He saves my bacon. I don't want to go there. Wow. Who do you call in the middle of the night? Well, it <laughs> depends. If you got a son like that, you can call him and cry and blubber, and he won't laugh or nothing. Um, and here we are. Think about this. He, he's supposed to be profitable, useful, and he's Ariston, exactly the opposite. That's like the prodigal son. It's like you. It's like me. It's like every lost person. But we can change. How super is that? How awesome is that? Forgive the personal reference, but back before I got saved, you know, I didn't know beans from apple butter about spiritual matters. Not really. And uh, didn't know where I was going to spend eternity. Had no clue. Didn't, wouldn't know how to tell somebody else how to know where they're going to spend eternity. And everything changed. Everything changed because someone gave me some information, just like Paul gave to Philemon. What, what an amazing thing. And my life took a different tack. And I wound up someplace I thought I'd never be. And I thought I gave up some stuff. And you know what? I'm finding I haven't even given up some stuff. 
or what I gave up is starting to come back to me. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. Tomorrow may be a red letter day. I'm telling you what, you can't make this stuff up. God is awesome. Didn't Jesus say, whatever you lay down, I'll give it back to you? How much? A hundred times. I wanted to do this, and the Lord said, no, I want you to do this. I, I let it go. Well, that, yeah. Barb let go of horses. Yeah, she let go of horses for the Lord. She said, I don't want to get involved in that because it will blunt my focus. And, you know, we were traveling evangelistic and mission trips and whatnot. And uh, we'd be in bookstores. Remember those? Bookstores. I used to like those. I like the smell, you know. I like the smell. Have coffee, you know. And we go to a bookstore and be, go to the magazine rack, and there's all these horse magazines. Hey, Barb, why don't you grab one? I'll, I'll grab one of these for you. Nope, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even bring it here. Why? Once I take, start reading that, I'll, be, it's, I'll fall right back in, you know. And so she let it go. Guess what? God gave everything back to her. Mom bought her a horse, 1990, and she's been messing with horses. And unfortunately, it's catching. I made the mistake of asking her a few questions, you know, on our date night. Now, about horses, you know. I don't know anything about them. I'm not for or against them. Only thing I knew was a little boy, you know, on a little pony. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, but that's another story for another time or never. But um, it came back to her, amen? It came back to her. Now listen to what he says. You can become who you are. But now, both to you and to me, instead of Ariston, Paul says he's Evriston. He adds this little prefix, E-U, it looks like in English, Epsilon, Epsilon, which means good. And the word, you know, it would be good without the prefix. So he's kind of like, I feel like he's saying, not only is he useful now and profitable now, he's very useful, very profitable. How many track with me? Yeah. It's not just that he took the alpha away, you know, Ariston, not useful, but he adds goodly useful, you know, or goodly profitable. In other words, even more of what he was in the natural before salvation. How many of you have heard people talk about the gospel like this? Now, when Jesus came, he gave us back what we lost in Adam. How many have heard that? That's what's usually preached. We lost out with God in the fall, which we did. But now in Christ, we're back where God had Adam and Eve. No, we're not. We're beyond that. Adam and Eve never ate of the tree of life. Had they done, they would, have had, they would have had God's life, what you and I understand is the new birth. We're not getting back what Adam and Eve lost. We're getting what they never had. Yeah, before they fell, they were neutral. I like the financial illustration. It's like a zero balance. They were neutral. They were fresh from the hand of God. They were innocent, but they were not positively righteous. They were just neutral. They, they, they had a zero balance when they lost out with God and ate from the wrong tree, they went from zero balance to in the red. How many know what it means to be in the red? No fun. Here's a deep truth. Take it with you tonight. The important thing about money is to have some. Now, when had they eaten of the tree of life, they would have gone from zero to black. Money in the bank. How many know there's a difference? Yeah, plus rather than minus. I mean, if I have to choose between being in the red and having nothing, I'll take nothing. But if you, if, you, if you give me a choice between in the red, nothing, or 10 grand in the bank, what, what are you going to take? Well, that's the new birth times a million. We don't get back what we lost only. We got more. Aren't you glad? So he's not Ariston anymore, useless, unprofitable. He's Evriston. Very useful, very profitable. Picture again of what you and I have in salvation. He had been a slave, as we mentioned, a household slave or servant, and a thief. Listen to what Paul says, whom I sent back. Now, what does he want from his friend Philemon? But you receive for yourself this one, actually my heart. Uh, it's kind of difficult to um, paraphrase this, but the idea is, it's almost like Paul's pointing to this guy. This same guy that has been useless, has not lived up to his name, he's been unprofitable, worse, he's actually been a thief and then ran away with no idea of coming back. 
This same guy now, well, you could say he's my alter ego. When you receive him back, you're receiving my heart. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Paul was not a, like a lot of these ignorant preachers, you know, that believe their own press. He had no problem recommending somebody. He didn't have to always be number one or under the spotlight. He said to uh, the Corinthians, I think it was the Corinthians, he said about Timothy, he works the work of God as I do. What better thing can you possibly say, you know? Man, that's awesome. But that's the way Paul was. He said, receive him as my heart. The word there is splunkna, which literally means my innards, you know, my stomach, my spleen, symbolic, metaphorically, of my inner man. He, I'm sending my heart to you, you know. If I send Solomon that, I could say that I'm sending my heart to you. Um, now, about now, aren't you saying, hey, sign me up for this deal? Aren't you? Yeah. Why don't we see more Christians living in the fullness of this, becoming who we really are after the new birth? You know, really enjoying it. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. Go back to verse 6. And this is a little, again, a little bit of a diamond in the dust that you have to look at. He's talking now not about Onesimus, but he's talking to Philemon. And this is what he says after he brags on him a while. You know, everybody knows what a great guy you are, your faith and everything. Verse 6, he says that the fellowship or the sharing of your faith may become effective. How? How will you and I become more and more effective sharing our faith and whatever gifts God's given us? Watch this. By means of the full knowledge. So it's not just the knowledge, but it's the full knowledge. Epignosi. The full knowledge. How many have a translation that says something like, of every good thing that's in you? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. How many believe you and I need to know who we are? What our strengths are? What our gifts are? There's nothing wrong with looking at it that way. But I put this under the microscope. Um, you probably, if you know me at all, you know, sometimes I'm meticulous to a fault, you know, but I believe in the verbal inspiration of the scripture. The words were chosen by the Holy Spirit. They came through men. And I looked this up and the way this is originally written, there's an article before the word um, good thing. First of all, it's singular. And so you could, I personally think you can paraphrase it like this. The sharing of your faith, the living of your Christian life, fulfilling your assignment, um, you know, doing what you were created to do, be and have, however we want to look at that, it will become effective as you and I gain a full knowledge of the entire good thing, the one in you. Do you see how that's a little different? What's the good thing in us? Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What did Paul pray for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 17 and following? That God would give you a, a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of his will for your life. What Paul, I believe, is saying is the more you know about the God within you, the more effective your faith will be. The more you know about God, the less your flesh will limit what he can do through you, basically. Amen? I'm not saying that you can't look at it the other way. I've looked at it that way, but I just never noticed this. When there's an article before this word all or every, it carries the concept of entire. And this is singular. The entirety of the good thing that's in you. And how do we do that? Well, one thing we can do is pray, right? I mean, Paul prayed for us to have this kind of knowledge. I'm looking for that verse. Solomon, you know where that is? Ephesians 1. Anybody have that in front of them? Who's going to race and get it before I will? Ephesians 1.17. Uh, looks like I'm going to get there first. Um, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge, same word, epignosis, the 
that the full knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart being enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling you and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power working in us who believe. And he uses the illustration of the resurrection. That's about as powerful as we need, right? You know, the man's dead three days and the power of God raises him. If God can do that, what else can he do? Just about anything we need, amen? But I think we need to see this. Who was I, who was I talking to the other day? Jeff. And he said, what, we were talking about somebody not getting something. He said, he said what the person needs is the aha, aha, aha moment. How many like those? Where you've read something a hundred times and then suddenly, oh, Jeff used the example of math. I said, don't even say the word math to me. But anyway, he said he would see in algebra, you know, the same problem, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And then, oh, wait a minute. And finally, you connect the dots. And that's what Paul's on about there, you know. Sometimes when we really see what we have, it changes the way we live. And that's an ongoing thing, right? So has this been helpful? Do you think we're okay kind of looking at, at this guy prophetically as uh, an illustration of lost humanity? I think so. And uh, we don't know really where he wound up, but I would say he wound up in the ministry. There's probably some, you know, legends or uh, traditions about him. I haven't bothered to look at that stuff. Not that it's wrong, but it's not scripture, you know. But anyway, I think it's kind of exciting stuff. You, you, you and I can actually become who we really are, who God created us to be regardless of what's happened to us, regardless of how rough the road has been or how many wrong turns we've made or who's done what to us, whatever. We can bounce back and, and uh, have more than we ever thought. Any questions tonight? Yeah, sure. We really don't know when we reach that point that we are who God wants us to be. Because yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, you know, I don't think we get there in this life. You know, Paul said, Paul said we know in part isn't that something we know in part? I'm so glad he said that. No, he said hadn't, hadn't become at the summit yet. Prophesy in part, you know. I'm so glad he said that. Uh, for anybody else? Little commercial or teaser. Have you heard anything about strongholds in the Christian life? We got it ready to tear down these strongholds, you know, in the mind and all that. You want to come to church Sunday? Find out what that's really about. My heart, I'll tell you, goes out to Christians <laughs> that are being made thought watchers, you know, all day long. You've got to pull it down, a stronghold, you know. I had this. What's that really about? It's, if you can spare the time, please come along on Sunday. I think we have a lot of fun, and it's so awesome. I've been reading this book for a while, and um, I've spoken on it generally, that concept, that that subject, but I never saw it like I did so clearly. Aren't you glad for this book? And if you've maybe struggled because you read some famous person's book that puts you under a lot of stress, you know, and a bunch more things you have to do, you know, get rid of these strongholds and how deep they are and this and that, you're going to just kind of breathe easy Sunday. I, I think God's so wonderful. So we're going to be looking at tearing down strongholds on the Lord's Day. We'll come around the Lord's table tonight, and if you're giving, that's great. Just leave your gifts here or the basket in the hall. God's really looking after us. Um, and we'll have the Lord's suffering.